here we are. Okay, relaxed. Yeah, good. Um, our next presentation is going to be by David Azarovitz um, of Arkanoa. David is a hardware designer and software designer uh, with Arkanoa, and he's one of the principals of the company. And this presentation, Arkanoa Device Drivers, will be a brief recap of some of the things that have been done with Arkanoa, uh, Arca OS uh, device drivers in the past year. So, and some of the things that he's working on now and hope to see in the near future. Um, all right, well, go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Hello, I'm David. Let's talk a little bit about some of the Arkanoa device drivers. And let's start with USB. The current version of the USB drivers that is released is 12.09. In this version, in the XHCI driver, I reworked transferring management code. The code in prior versions was inspired or borrowed from Unix. It turns out that didn't work so well, so I wrote my own, and now it's stable and reliable. In the USB-D driver, I fixed a problem configuring a device when multiple class drivers try and claim it. Now, in some cases, when different class drivers both want to configure the same device, there could have been problems. For example, if you have one device that, that controls both a keyboard and mouse, these are quite common, the one device is controlled by both the keyboard driver and the mouse driver. The issue of configuring that device in that situation has been resolved. I also enhanced resource management strings presented to the resource manager by the drivers. So that means there's additional useful information in the hardware manager or in other places that might display those resource manager strings. In USB calls, I enhanced buffer management to accommodate certain applications. It turns out that certain types of applications have peculiar ways of passing in buffer pointers and an enhancement was added to accommodate these. In USB MSD, I fixed some buffer problems. There were some rare issues that could occur when dividing up the buffer pool among the various devices. That was fixed. I also cleaned up and fixed the eject logic. There were some issues with some types of devices that wouldn't eject the media properly. That was fixed. And this is important because ejecting the media on some devices, those devices use that event to complete any pending writes and flush the caches. Now, obviously, if you don't finish any last minute writes or flush the caches and then you pull the stick out, you could have corrupted file system issues. So that was fixed. I also fixed problems with multi LUN devices. Devices that have multiple logic units would take a very long time to attach if you didn't have media in every one of the slots. The driver would essentially keep retrying the media not present error for the slots that didn't have any media in them over and over and over until a very long timeout occurred. And that was fixed. I also added support for disks larger than two terabytes. The driver now supports any size disks. Now, although the driver supports big disks, that doesn't automatically mean that the kernel does, and it doesn't autom automatically mean that other parts of the system does. So you cannot just go out and start using big disks on current Arca OS 5.0 systems. I also added GPT and MBR disk detection. Previously, the USB MSD driver didn't even look at what kind of disk was attached. Extra steps were added to the media attach algorithm to detect MBR disks and GPT disks so that it can attach them in appropriate ways. Now, although the driver recognizes GPT disks, that doesn't automatically mean that the kernel does, and it doesn't automatically mean that the rest of the system does either. So it does not mean that you can go 
and use these types of disks on current ARCA OS 5.0 systems. Coming in version 12.10, I fixed a problem in USB PRT that can cause the driver to hang. Until this version is released, if you are using a USB connected printer, and only in the case you're using a USB connected printer, just make sure it's plugged in and turned on, and that should avoid the hang. I also added a cork to make some Alcor devices work better. And there might be a few other things added before 12.10 gets officially released. Now, special for this presentation, let's talk a little bit about how USB mass storage devices work. Suppose you have a USB MSD and you plug it in. It will have at least one logical unit, but maybe more. Let's, um, so you could have a, a device like this, a USB stick. This is a single device, and it probably has one medium permanently attached inside. But that's not the only kind of device you could have. You could have something like this. This is a, a four-slot cart reader. It has four slots. It's one device. It presents to the system as one device with four logical units, and you can plug in up to four media into this device. You could also have a device like this. This is a two-slot disk reader. It presents as one device and two logical units in which I can plug in up to two media, one in each slot. There are also lots of other types of devices. This one, for example, is, looks like a normal USB stick, but when you plug it in, it presents as two devices. This actually has a hub in it. So when you plug this in, you get one hub and one device connected to that one hub with one medium attached to the device. So there's lots of types of devices. So let's now look back at the one device that we have here. And it's got four logical units in it. Lucky us. Each logical unit connects to one kernel disk unit. Now the kernel talks to mass storage, any type of mass storage, through disk units. The OS2 kernel cannot really add or delete disk units after it is booted. And that's why OS2 does not really support hot plug disk devices. The USB MSD driver gets around this by pre-attaching a bunch of fixed disk units at initialization time. The number of pre-attached disk units is defined by the removable switch on the USB MSD command line in your config.sys. And this is also why you see exactly this many so-called dummy USB devices in LVM, NDFC, and other places. These are the placeholders where USB devices get attached later. So when you plug in your USB MSD, the driver attaches each logical unit in the device to a kernel disk unit. If there are more logical units in the device, then there are available disk units to attach them to, then none of the logical units in the device will get attached. So, for example, if you have in your config.sys removables set to four, and then you plug in a device with five LUNs, five logical units, it's going to just sit there and do nothing. You'll think it's not seeing it. It actually does see the device. It just cannot attach the logical units. 
you need to have enough removables specified in your config.sys that will accommodate all of the LUNs, all of the logical units that you intend to attach at the same time. But beware, don't just specify an arbitrarily high number because the higher the number of removables that you specify, the more resources get used up and the lower performance gets for everything. So the ideal case is you want to choose the lowest number of removables that gets the job done for what you need to do. So now that we have our MSD plugged in, let's insert some media. Oh look, we have medium that is partitioned into four partitions and each has its own drive letter. That medium gets attached through logical unit zero and routed through the first kernel disk unit. And then drive letters get assigned. Now these drive letters of course can move around depending on what else is going on in your system. But you're going to get four drive letters for the four partitions. Now we could also plug in another medium. Oh look, this one's also got four partitions on it and four new drive letters. This one gets connected through the third LUN and another kernel disk unit. And you get four more drive letters attached to the system. Believe it or not, this is not unusual. This is very commonplace. So, now what happens when you're done working with this setup? Everyone knows that you got to eject something or else you're going to get corrupted file systems the next time you try and use it. But, what do you eject? Most people think you eject drive letters with something like eject m. So you type eject m or you click on the, the, the unit and the letter and you, you eject that. But that's not correct. Yes, you do type eject m or you click on eject m. But that is not eject the drive letter. The system just uses that specified drive letter to locate the medium that contains the volume with that drive letter on it. And then it ejects the medium. You can only eject media. You cannot eject drive letters and you cannot eject devices. So when you do eject M, you eject that media and everything on it. That means that eject M necessarily and correctly removes all of the drive letters contained in that medium. Now, of course, ejecting one medium does not affect any other media still attached. You would need to eject them separately. Now, I said this already, but it's important to reiterate. OS2 does not have any way to eject a device you can only eject media. This means that as long as a USB device is still plugged in, it stays connected to the system, whether or not the media are still attached. Now, of course, you can always assign, reassign, and unassign drive letters, but that doesn't affect the media, and that doesn't affect the device. That's just what LVM does as its presentation to the system. In many cases, You'll just have a single device with a single embedded, non-detachable medium inside, like this. In this case, it appears that the stick, the medium, the logical unit, the disk unit, and the drive letter all refer to the same thing. That's not true, but that correlation just adds to the confusion about what's going on behind the scenes. However, in this case of a single stick, with the medium permanently attached, not removable, you could still have more than one partition on this device. So you could have two partitions, for example, with two drive letters. And even though in this case the medium is permanently attached to the device, it still operates the same way and is still logically attached and detached in the same way. So whether you eject M or whether you eject N, they both eject the same medium and they both go away. All right, that's enough about USB. Let's talk about some of the other drivers. 
Panorama, for example, got an update. The current released version of Panorama is 1.17. I added a power management module, and this module can be used by things like the screensaver to turn off the screen. I also made a minor enhancement to the custom resolution module, and that just increases the probability that a custom resolution will work. Coming in version 1.18, enhanced error detection and validation of configurations for more reliable setup. This doesn't change the operation of Panorama, but it makes it easier to diagnose problems when they arise. Along the lines of display drivers, grad.sys got updated and is used in all of the grad drivers. The current released version of grad.sys is 2.04. It added support for some recent Intel CPUs, because Intel CPUs need to be handled individually by the grad.sys driver, and I enhanced the MTRR management capabilities. Now this driver is part of the base grad subsystem. Now although the base grad subsystem is a prerequisite to run any PM video driver like Snap or Panorama, the grad subsystem, the base grad subsystem, is separate from and not really part of any of those PM video drivers. Now, all PM video driver distributions contain a copy of this base grad subsystem just for convenience in installation, just in case it's not already installed on the system. So it's always possible that any given PM video driver distribution may contain an older copy of the base grad subsystem. So if you install one of these older distributions, it might downgrade some of the files like grad.sys. This is not normally an issue since files in the base grad subsystem rarely ever change. And if they do, the changes are normally really minor, as in this case. But just beware that the downgrade can occur if you install an older PM video driver. Now, in the disk, store, disk and storage class drivers, the ACI, AHCI driver current version is 12.08. Recent changes in that version I fixed a very minor problem reporting data to the resource manager. It's unlikely that anyone would ever have noticed that, but it did get fixed. I also added support for disks larger than two terabytes. I also fixed a very rare problem that could occur when you have unaligned transfers. And I modified the MBR detection algorithm to accommodate GPT disks. Now, Again, although the driver supports big disks and the driver recognizes GPT disks, this doesn't automatically mean that the kernel does or that any other part of the system does too. And it does not mean that you can use these types of disks on current ARCA OS 5.0 systems. The NVMe driver got released. The current version is 1.01. .01. This is an initial release and there are no known problems. The driver can handle up to 8 adapters and each adapter can have up to 16 namespaces on each adapter. Each namespace is mapped to one kernel disk unit. Remember the kernel disk units from our MSD discussion? So each namespace shows up as one disk in OS2. Namespaces must be properly configured in order to work on OS2, and that means they got to have 512 byte sectors and no metadata. Now all namespaces get attached, even if that namespace is not configured in a way that OS2 can use. And if it is not configured correctly, you'll see it, but it won't work. And, just in case anybody is wondering, the NVMe driver does already support storage larger than 2 terabytes and GPT media. And again, 
Although the driver supports big media and the driver recognizes GPT media, that doesn't automatically mean that the kernel does and doesn't automatically mean that other parts of the system do. So it does not mean that you can use these types of media on current ARCA OS 5.0 systems. JFS had an update. The current version is 1.09.09. .09. And in this version, I fixed a cache read-ahead problem. This fix is in the IFS driver in itself. And in some cases, an unusual sequence of opening and then accessing certain files could result in a hung file system. It's a pretty bizarre combination, but it's been fixed and doesn't happen anymore. Now UniOD got an update. Uh, the current GA UniOD package is dated 2021-07-31. In that package it contains the good old UniOD 16 1.9.7 and this is the same UniOD 16 that we've been using for a while. It also contains an updated UniOD 32 version 3.01.02 and that's based on the Linux kernel version 5.10.50, one of the later ones. Now Paul Smedley, Paul Smedley did all the work porting this and getting it working. I just built the distribution packages. And there are also some newer beta builds available on the NetLab's UniOD track page and also available on the ARCANOA UniOD wiki. All of the new versions, including the GA version, seem to work on a much larger variety of systems than previous builds did. But there's still a, there's a few very minor issues with them. And I'm not going to going I'm not going to get into what those are here, but there are details on the Arkanoa UniOD wiki if you want to look there. Work continues on the development of wireless drivers and they have actually moved up in the priority list recently. Now, I've tried several approaches to porting existing Unix drivers to OS2, kind of like what's done with the current Multimac wired drivers. But every attempt has failed. The architecture is just too radically different. That means the architecture of the, uh, the Unix drivers. They, don't, they just don't map into what, US, what, uh, what um, OS2 wants to see. So it appears the old Multimac approach just isn't going to work. So now I'm working on a different approach, similar to how some of the other non-network drivers for OS2 were created. And so far, this seems to be going quite a bit better. And that's it for recent driver development on ARCA OS drivers. Thanks for watching. Hi, David. Hello. Okay, let, let, let's check the questions, if there are any questions. I've been, um, I've been answering on the the chats and things when I can. Well, sadly, I was not able to hear the last part of your video because I was switching here. But I, I think I hear that you're changing the strategy for the wireless drivers, right? That, that Multimax was correct. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking it's going to work. It's going to work a lot better. So far, so good. That's good. So that there is some progress there. You, you have, you, yes. you yes. already there's, started. There's been, yeah. there's been ongoing work. Keep getting distracted by some other, you know, by other things that are more important. But I'm getting back to it a lot. I'm putting a lot more time into it now. OK. We have one question about um, um, Unial. Um, they are asking if there is any way or if you see a, a, a way to put multi-stream audio in the future of UniAL. I really can't answer that. 
I don't know. Paul's the one that's been doing the port from Linux into the uni odd source. And I, I don't know if that's if any multi-stream support's ever going to happen. I won't say no, but I don't know. Okay, let's see if there's... Oh, sorry. Hang on. Okay. Let's see if there's any other question. I don't see any. Uh, yeah, I don't see any other question. Oh, if, if there is any estimated release date for the Wi-Fi driver? Oh. No, I don't have an estimated release date at this point. And but I'll be hanging around in chat for the entire conference, so I, I'll be available to answer questions if people have them and they come up. Okay, okay. And I'm guessing also, David, that you're working on the Intel Wi-Fi driver, right? That does... That's going to be one of the first ones that come up, yeah. There are actually a couple of different Intel ones, but I'm going to be making the one that... Um, will cover the most number of chips first. Okay. Th there was a more specific question uh, of Nathan Woodruff about the about Panorama and the resolution of his video card on the on the YouTube chat. And it says I, I think yeah, Panorama I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that seems more like a ticket type question. Okay, okay. It's more like something very specific of, of his hardware and and yeah, he's he trying to see if there is a way to to change the resolution that goes by default on the boot process. That's kind of hard, right? But well. Um, the way Panorama works is it it tries to read the display configuration directly from the display and use that. So it attempts to try and run the display exactly the way the display wants to be run. That's called the uh, native resolution. And there's, a, there's an option to choose the na use native resolution in the screen object. And if you select that option, it will automatically use the screen's native resolution, if it can. Otherwise, um, Panorama lets you set whatever re resolution you want, whatever resolutions the BIOS offers, it'll let you choose those, even if they don't work. Because there's no way to know whether they'll work or not. Okay. But for any specific help with specific hardware or specific configurations, that's a ticket item, open a ticket. Yeah, it will be better to, to for, for Nathan to, to open a ticket and it get documented there to, to go more specific. Right. Than that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm trying to check if there is any other question. Well, I, I don't see any more questions. I just see people thanking you for, for the okay. progress. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah, I don't see any driver specific questions right now. That there is a okay. question that if maybe Louis are going to talk about more about the kernel and the components, but uh, and the roadmap of the of the kernel development. Well, let's see if Louis talk about that. That I don't think is right now related to drivers. Even that everything is related to the kernel. Okay, but no, I don't. Yeah, see everything. The yeah. kernel runs everything. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe they're specifically addressing my comments about you know just because you have a driver that supports big disks, that doesn't mean that there's other facilities that the rest of the system does, and that's why there's the features in Arca OS 5.1 that allow you to use these drivers. See, these drivers are required to make all the stuff in Arca OS 5.1 actually work. But the drivers are just drivers, and they can, you can install them anywhere. And just because they have these, these additional 
capabilities, that doesn't mean there's anything in the system that can make use of those extra capabilities. And that's where those extra capabilities are, are in ArcOS 5.1 and they are not in ArcOS 5.0. That's the distinction. Okay. Okay, there's another question about UniOut, but, but I think it, that it's also a ticket related because it's a specific about a, a kind of machine. So, Daniel, it would be great if you can open a ticket uh, about, uh, about that, that specific computer with UniOut. Yeah, that, that's, that's possible. I mean, you can also try one of the newer betas. There's some newer betas because Paul's been continually porting the newer versions. And whenever he does, I create a new, a new beta, essentially, that people can test out and try if they want. Otherwise, in some cases, like on, my, um, on, on one of my systems, I do need to go back to one of the older versions because the newer one just doesn't work. And um, we'll look into these things as time goes on. Okay. But at least there's drivers that you can use that work. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm checking if there's any other question, but I think that there's there are no more questions. Um, You're very good right now. So what what we're going to do? We're going to stand by a little bit until your next video. Okay. And uh, because we want to respect the schedule, <laughs> yeah, and the timing. And we will run the next video in, in like, I don't know, like 20 minutes. Okay. And we will And I'll stick over. around. I'll stick yeah. around in the chat. If anybody has other questions, I'll be here. And I can pay more attention to the chats now that I'm not actually talking live. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. So thank you very much, David. Sure. For your time. See you in a little while. In, in a while. And okay. well, we're going to be in standby for for some minutes. Uh, well, so every, everybody in the stream can go to the bathroom, take a break, and we will continue. Okay, thank you. All right.